Welcome to Life After Fame Podcast. Just imagine 70,000 fans cheering your name when you've scored the winning touchdown. Imagine standing on stage looking out at the crowd, rocking out to that chart-busting song you created. The applause and recognition you received for your masterful acting performance in that latest blockbuster movie. And then, one day, the cheering stops. This podcast is all about catching up with these stars of yesterday to find out where they're at now and who they are as people beyond the stardom. This is a true human interest podcast about the people we love to root for. And now your hosts, Joe Mastriona and Joe Boglino. Welcome to Life After Fame. This week, we have former Denver Bronco and Michigan Wolverine DeMonte Thomas. In this episode, DeMonte talks about getting used to being uncomfortable and the importance of perseverance when faced with a transition in your life. In 2020, Thomas's professional football career ended due to an injury with the Denver Broncos releasing him. The emotional toll he went through after his three-year stint as a Bronco challenged him to redefine himself. Today, he owns a sports performance training company, DeMonte Thomas Sports Academy to help develop the next generation of athletes using science-backed performance training and the first-hand knowledge of being a professional athlete. You're going to gain so much life perspective from this episode. We hope you enjoy it. We want to welcome to the show DeMonte Thomas, Bronco from 2017 to 2019. DeMonte, thank you so much for joining Life After Fame. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Really excited to be here. Yeah, thanks, Demonte, for what Joe said, joining us. We really appreciate it. Not only Bronco, but also a former Michigan Wolverine, so very dear to my heart as my family's from Michigan and <laughs> absolutely love the Wolverines. I don't know if you can see behind Demonte, but I, I set I up a prop the, for you, man. Yeah, so I got I some Bronco, helmet. Bronco gear and Michigan gear for you. So now we'll jump right into, I want to jump into your high school career as well as then flowing into questions about choosing, because I know you're from Ohio and choosing Michigan over Ohio State probably made a lot of people upset back home, but (laughs) we'll jump into that. So tell us a little bit about your, yeah, your high school career and the sports that you played beyond football, if you did. Just give us a little bit of your background. Yeah, so growing up as a kid, I always played multiple sports. I did baseball, I did wrestling, I did track, I did football. Tried basketball, wasn't too good at that. So I actually got a funny story about that. And I went into high school and dialed in on three sports, and that was football, baseball, and wrestling. Those are three sports that I truly enjoyed. I really loved baseball a lot. It was one of those sports that I didn't start out being really good, but once I started getting a hang of it, I'll, I became a really good player. I had scouts for baseball coming to my games, and that was pretty cool. And I thought for a moment I was going to go to the MLB. I was chasing the money and everything that comes with the MLB. But then my parents sat me down and said, hey, I think it's important for you to get to go to college, get education, because at the end of the day, they can never take away your degree, which is true. Sports can always be taken away from you, which is also true, as I saw my, unfortunately, my career in injury. So at that point, it was coming down to which school I wanted to go to. And I knew I wanted to go to a school with a good football program, and I wanted to go to a school with great education because if football didn't work out, it was what could I do? And nothing against Ohio State. Ohio State's a great school, but at the same time, it's like, Michigan's the number one public school. It's always top tier of everything for sports, for education, for alumni. They just have the best of the best. And so for me, the the final decision factor was the education that Michigan offered compared to Ohio State. And I remember when I committed to Michigan, everybody was mad at me. That was like Ohio State fans and from my hometown. But ultimately, I didn't care. It was a decision to put me in the place I am now. So I think it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. And I enjoyed my time there. And I meet so many Michigan alumni everywhere I go, no matter what state I'm in. I can even be on vacation out of the country. Actually, I did a podcast <laughs> literally like a week ago with a kid that I met in Mexico on vacation like three or four years ago. And he was a Michigan fan and he has a podcast. <laughs> so it's just cool how Michigan connects random people. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. That's awesome. The blue extends very far. Yeah, yes. It does. Yes. Hey, like yeah. the ocean. <laughs> That's right. I love it. <laughs> hey, DeMonte, before I ask a couple questions around this recruitment process, you've enticed us. What's this funny story about basketball? Yeah. So my cousins and all my good friends growing up, they always played basketball and 
I was always a pretty good athlete. So, you know, they asked me to come play basketball because I was really good on defense. But when you're playing street ball, no one really called fouls. But when you get in the actual game with refs, I guess there's just things called <laughs> fouls that you're not supposed to do. <laughs> And unfortunately, I was just playing basketball. I think it was my first game. And I fouled out the first quarter of the first game. I was, they called me the hacker, I guess. But <laughs> literally, my, my dad came down to the, yeah, literally. My dad came down to the basketball court and was like, son, I just don't think this is a sport that you're going to be good at. So let's just stick to the sports we're good at. And I think my dad, I can't remember exactly, but I think he let me finish the season because he never let me quit. But I think it was painful for him to watch me play basketball. but <laughs> So I was like, yeah, you know, out of all sports, the one I want to be really good at, of course, I'm not good at it. So yeah, <laughs> it's all right. Three out, hey, of, three out of four is not bad. Y- yeah, I was just going to say, it sounds like, obviously, you played football at a very high level. You do not get to go to Michigan, play at Michigan without playing at a very high level. And then you also entered pro football, played for the Broncos for three years, correct? Was it yes, sir. three years? Yeah. Yeah. And that, so nothing to be ashamed about that. And then you also were getting recruited by Major League Baseball to play baseball. That is amazing. So what position did you play, DeMonte, in baseball? I was a center fielder and I was a leadoff. Okay. I was super fast, catch pretty much anything in the outfield. And if I bunt, if I hit it anywhere besides a pitcher, I even joke sometimes and say, even if anybody besides a pitcher, I'll be safe. And a lot of people always ask, where about the first baseman? I was like, usually they're fat and slow, so usually I can beat them too. But <laughs> yeah, I was just, I was super fast. I could just move around those bases and a single will turn into a triple real quick mm-hmm. because I was just still second and still third. And so yeah. it was fun. So was it the decision to play baseball or not to play baseball? Was it based off of the academics and going to college? Was, it, was there ever a thought to say, hey, I should play baseball as well at Michigan? Or was it too hard to do a multi-sport like that? So I thought about it, but the thing is football is year-round for college. So when baseball is around, football is starting to take off. So it's like one of those things where you have to make a decision yourself is you can't, my dad always told me you can't half-ass something. If you're going to do something, you got to be there 110%, especially baseball and football, which is such a team sport. He was just like, all right, cool. You're there because you you got a full ride for football and you want to play baseball. But if it came down to it, if you had a game on the same day, who are you choosing? And right. he's that should be the team that you're focused to. And I said, football, he's like, then don't worry about baseball, son. Like you, you lived out your dream. You did everything you can. Just worry about football, focus on football, and then getting your degree. So my dad was, he was really, my dad wasn't successful as much growing up. He didn't come from, he came, my grandpa was trying to, my grandpa raised him. The way that my dad raised me, the only difference is I listened to my dad. He didn't listen to his dad. (laughs) So my dad and grandpa always had so much knowledge. So like anything, and even to this day, I'm always just, my dad's always right. Like he he just knows so much. So I've always listened to him. And when he told me that, I was just like, yeah, he's right. Let's just focus on football, get a degree and show my football team that I'm 110% committed and I'm all in. You were a two-way athlete on the football field, right? You were a DB and also a running back. Did you have any preference when you approached these schools? And you're a top 40 recruit in the nation. Yeah. So, DeMonte, it, it's just such a level of success that it, for us normal guys, it's mind-blowing. Your statistics as a running back are quite solid in high school. Did you feel like, man, I'd like to run the ball versus defend? What was your thought process there? And did Michigan ever give you that opportunity? Or did other schools give you the opportunity to maybe be on the offensive side of the ball? So that's the thing was the one team that was just like, hey, we just want you for defense. We don't need you for both ways. We really want you to focus on defense. And then other teams were, hey, we want you to focus on playing offense and not defense and vice versa and things like that. But I knew in order for me to make it to the NFL, I had to go play defense. I knew I, was, I wouldn't get big like Derrick Henry as a running back. And I knew those hits would take a toll on me. Yeah. And in high school, we ran the triple option. And the running back next to me ended up going to Tennessee on a full ride scholarship. And we ran triple option. So he got the ball way more than myself. But he was the one taking more of the hits because he obviously carried the ball more than me. But yeah, I really love running the ball. There's just nothing better when you get that ball in your hand and just the things that go through your mind as you're cutting or juking or doing something fancy to, to try to break loose. It's just crazy. I wish sometimes that people could just, I wish there's somebody could connect to your brain or your helmet and just so people can see like, what is he like? How? Cause it, yeah, because it's kind of like art. Like being a running back is kind of like art to me because it's like sure. you're taking an ugly description in front of you and you're turning it into something <laughs> beautiful which is a touchdown and sometimes the things i used to think out there i'm just like like i get done and i watch film i'm like what in the world was i even thinking how did that even happen what was i doing it just looked smooth and natural so running back was cool i love it yeah and you were 
a fantastic safety. So it makes sense. Hard hitting safety. Your coach, like, and I don't take this lightly, your high school coach compared you to Troy Polamalu, which is amazing attribute, like where to be compared to a Hall of Famer in the NFL, it had to feel good for sure. And so, yeah, I know that you were definitely bound for safety. Paint the picture for us, Demonte, of what it felt like when you first stepped out on the field for your very first game, maybe the game that you were going to play in, you knew you were going to play in the big house. What yeah. did that feel like? Because I can only imagine in my head, always being a Michigan fan, dreaming of playing for Michigan. I know what I think I would feel, but I would love to hear <laughs> what you really felt. Yeah. Yeah, I was excited. My first game, my first play ever was my year, I played first game, I was on special team. So that was cool too, coming from a small city that I come from and being able to start your freshman year in college at a big D1 school. You're going against a grown men at that point. And the first play of my career, I blocked the punt and we scooped and scored. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty cool. I actually sat out the rest of the game though, because when I blocked the punt, I got kicked in the stomach. That kind of hurt a lot, but it was fun. I treated it just like any other game, but my ultimate goal was the NFL. So. I took it in a little bit, but I was like, you're not finished. There's more to do. Sure. There's more to accomplish. So I was. it was more of a humbling experience saying four more years and all your hard work that you put in since you were five will pay off. So it was more of that kind of feeling than, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's here. Like I finally did it. It's time for me to just relax and just enjoy this next four years. Did you ever stand in the middle of that stadium and just look around and go, holy, this has got to be incredible? Honestly, I didn't do that until like my senior year. I was playing against Indiana and it was a snowstorm and it was a close game. And we're getting ready to play Ohio State and this is our senior year. And we know if we beat Ohio State, we're in a playoff. So we're, for a moment, we just sat there in the middle of the field. Mm -hmm all of us seniors, and we just thought like all the things that we went through. Because our freshman and sophomore year, we weren't that good. And then junior year, we picked it up. And senior year, we were good. So it was just a lot, like a lot that we went through as a class together. And I think only like maybe two or three kids end up transferring from our class. And we have, I can't remember exactly how many kids, maybe 20 or 30 something. So it was just cool to see all of us come together our senior year. This is our last, this is our last hoorah. Like we got laid all on the line against Ohio State next week. So I think that was the first time out of all four years I just stood in the middle of the field and just took it all in. And I think I want to mention that it, it obviously, to be successful on those types of levels, it takes a tremendous amount of mental discipline. And you just mm -hmm. spoke to that, which was like, I was trying to get you to say, man, I was standing there and I was so nervous and none <laughs> of that was happening for you, which is amazing. And that's <laughs> why you were so successful, DeMonte, in my opinion, is I think that, of course, you were appreciative, you were humbled by the situation, like you said, but you were still very focused on attaining your goal, which was the NFL and I want to transition into that. And so you were an undrafted free agent by the Broncos. And so when they picked you up, were there other teams? Because I know with undrafted free agents, there's still, it's not just one team trying to vie for you, multiple teams going. And so what made you pick the Broncos over other teams? I think the biggest thing was defensive backs. That they had a key to leave Chris Harris, Darren Stewart, Justin Simmons, Will Parks, and you have Von Miller, you have Darren Stewart, you have TJ Ward. You have all these guys that are probably going to be, a lot of them are going to be Hall of Famers. So it was like one of those things where even if I wouldn't have made the team, I could have soaked up so much knowledge of the game from them that if I would have got cut, I could have went somewhere else and just been on a whole nother level because I came from a good background. It's like a, yeah. almost like one of those big fish, small pond mindset. So that's what I was thinking. And a lot of people always ask, like, what made you even think that far ahead? And I'm, I've always thought two to three steps ahead. And if you do that, you become successful. But if you're always trying to think as things happen, and sometimes you do got to think on the fly, but if you're always trying to think on the fly, it's very hard to be successful because instead of getting ahead of things, you're reacting off things that are happening to you. So my mind is always, everything that I do in life, there's a plan behind it. It's not just, I'm just doing it just to do it. It's something I'm trying to do to get me to my ultimate goal. And it takes a long time to get there. And sometimes it takes forever, but it's like one of those things where you always have to think that whatever move you make has to be worth it and has to have a purpose to reach your final goal. So that's what my thing was. You know what's so. interesting about what you said there is I thought that you might say the landscape for my position at this particular team was thin. It was weak. I had a better chance to make the team. But what you said was you recognized a big fish, little fish metaphor here. And 
I think there's a lot of people that would look at that and be just intimidated by going up against these guys that have been all pros. They just achieved a Super Bowl a couple of years prior. But what you decided to do was, okay, I'm a little fish because I'm coming in to this big fish pond. I'm not intimidated by it. And I'm going to take the knowledge from it to continually grow my career. DeMonte, I think that's mm-hmm. amazing. That speaks to a mental capacity yeah. that's lost on a lot of fans because as I mentioned before, I think the natural human nature approach would be, listen, they've got holes at safety. They've got holes at corner. I can make the team. But you weren't looking at it from that perspective. Nah, never. If you take the easy way out and you get comfortable with taking the easy way out of things, then you, how can you be successful? But if you get used to taking the hard route and doing things that are challenging and pushing you and encourage you, at some point, you're going to get used to being uncomfortable hmm. to the point where... Anything that happens, you're going to be able to either accomplish it, either get past it or move forward with it. So you can't take the easy way in life. And just little things like that helps you in life. Like it's now I'm at a point where, okay, everyone's thinking like, all right, he's thinking about this for football. But ultimately behind it is, okay, DeMonte, if football don't work out, here's what you got. Here's your mentality behind it is you did something that one, that only 1% of athletes can do, but then two, you put yourself in a hard position. So when you get a job after football or something like that, you're going to be used to the hard position. You're going to be used to putting yourself in situations where a lot of people wouldn't want to, and then you're going to get comfortable with it. So anything that happens, you're going to be able to just dominate it. So you can never take the easy way, unless it's like doing your lawn or washing your car or something like that. But in life, you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable is the biggest thing I would say. So that's what I wanted to do there and create that atmosphere for my mind. Did you, DeMonte, did you get that mindset on your own? Did you get it from your parents or is it specifically from your dad or where did you get that mindset from? Because I, like Joe said, I find that to be an extremely unique mindset and one that I share, for sure Mm -hmm. I share, but I do want to know where's the origin of that mindset that came to you like that? Because it's high level. Yeah, I don't know. My real mom wasn't really in my life that much, but my dad was pretty much who raised me. And my dad was a Marine. So I think a lot of things that he taught me, I listened. And I think nowadays kids, when parents say something, it's in one ear and out the other. But whenever my dad would say something to me, I was like a sponge. Like I was soaking it in and soaked it in and soaked it in and soaked it in. And even to this day, I still soak in the knowledge that he gives to me because it's so much knowledge. It's so much free knowledge too. And my dad's been through every experience that I've been through pretty much besides the NFL and stuff. But then I just think just growing up, poor and not having money and watching my dad struggle is that mindset where I was, I don't want to live that lifestyle. I don't want to be like this. I want to be able to take care of my family. I want to be able to help my dad out. And I think just the things that you go through in life makes you either stronger or makes you weaker. And I think a lot of things that I went through from growing up made me stronger. It made me realize that life is going to be hard. It also made me realize that somebody has a life that's worse than mine. So I have two options. I can sit here and complain about it, or I can get up every day and do whatever I can to reach my dreams and get closer to my goals in life. And I think at a very young age, I had to grow up from a lot of experiences that I've seen and witnessed with my dad and and other situations. So most five-year-olds are worried about what they're going to get for Christmas or what they're going to get for their birthday. I'm worried about, are we going to have the lights on at night? Are we going to be able to eat? Am I going to have clothes on my back? Am I going to have a roof over my head? So I grew up very fast as a kid. So that mindset started when I was five years old, six years old. It was just, you got, I got so used to it. That's all I knew. So I developed that mindset at a young, at a very young age. And through those experiences that I went through with my dad, he was showing me and telling me like, this is how we're going to do it. This is how you do it. This is the mindset you got to have. So I gave a lot of credit to my dad. And and then you meet other people on the the way. Like I had a high school coach that, that helped me a lot. And then I had another high school coach that also coached my dad and stuff. And He's probably like 65 or 70, but this man, if you've seen him, he still works out and run hills and stairs. He just got the mindset of a lion and just hanging around people like that. It's just all that. I just soaked it in and understood. I understood that that's, yeah. that's what it was. Well, you had an awareness awfully young. That's quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Comfort is a sinister mistress. And we all mm-hmm. are taught to go to get to that point. We want to get to a point of comfort yeah. where we can pay our bills, take care of our family. But yet there's an underbelly to comfort that makes you stagnant. It makes you apathetic. Yeah. And the fact that you talk about getting used to being uncomfortable, I think is super important because that drive always pushes your abilities. And 
you can gain such confidence from it because you've just gone into something unfamiliar, something uncomfortable, and it's become comfortable. And so you've continually raised. I think that really is a key to a person's success. And it's really incredible to hear that from someone from an athletic perspective who has achieved such tremendous heights because you have, you did, you played in the NFL, you were top 40 in recruitment, but you acquired DeMonte, you acquired awareness that I'm 53. I basically got that awareness maybe two years ago. You got that awareness when you were five. And I think it's really incredible. I think it speaks highly to your awareness of what it takes to be successful. Thank you. So let me ask you a question about the injury that occurred to you here, because I've just had hip replacement. I didn't have hip replacement. I had a labral tear. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, physically, no big deal. I think it hurt for a day. Yeah. But emotionally, what I went through, and my job, my livelihood doesn't depend on my physical capabilities. But you have yeah. this injury, and you've been probably dealing with injuries, playing sports. You've made the NFL, you're on the team, and this injury happens. Can you talk about, there is, for me, there was a major emotional toll. To going through what I've gone through. I, two yeah. weeks ago, I would tell you I couldn't even do anything by myself. Thank God for my wife, but that plays a toll on a guy. So you have an injury that yeah. really derails your trajectory. Can you talk through what the injury was, how it happened, and how did you deal with it? And what kind of advice can you give people about dealing with such a thing? Yeah, so I got hurt. Had in, I was playing against the Raiders, and it was on that, that crazy play, actually, where we punt the ball down to the one, and their guy, their punt returner, actually scoops it up on the one and scores. And I felt my knee just give out on me a little bit. But when you're undrafted, you can't really be hurt. So I played through the rest of that season. And after the season, I just told the trainers that my knee's messed up. I was like, there's something wrong with it. It's starting to feel like it's locking. It's starting to feel like there's a lot of clicking going on in there. And they just told me it's just a fatty tissue that's probably just swollen. So I was like, all right, cool. So. I trained super hard that off season, like I always do on uh, my trainer. And then long story short was playing against the preseason game against, might've been the Rams. And I was running out of tunnel. My knee just gave out on me. And I was like, that's weird that it's a non-contact injury. My knee just gave out to me, but I'm battling for position out of safety. So at that point, I just tell them my knee hurt and you can see it swollen up, but I was like, I got to finish this game. So I finished the game, get on a plane get home and I wake up the next morning, I can't even move my knee. So I go on there and the doctors tell me it's just swollen, it's just swollen cartilage. So I was like, all right, cool. You know, it is what it is. Then it just kept getting worse and worse. So then I go see a doctor in New York and he's like, yeah, man, like you got a piece of bone torn off your knee. You got a piece of cartilage that's floating. You got a piece of cartilage hanging off your knees. Like you're going to have to get, dude, you're going to have to redo surgery. You're going to get surgery. So I got the surgery and stuff and they, ended up, they thought it was only going to take a few weeks, but for all they had to repair, it took in, it ended up taking a year. For the first time, I played football since I was five, and that was the first injury that I had to sit out for a year. For once in my life, I felt like I didn't have control of my life or my destiny. And it took me a lot. And at the same time, my girl that I'm with now, we've been together for forever now, but we had a miscarriage too. So it was like one of those things where just life was just taking a toll on me. Her father died as well. So it was just like, we were dealing with so much. So I, at this point, I went back home to Ohio to do my rehab and she stayed out here in Colorado. And then she went home to, I believe for a little bit, be with her family because her dad and we were arguing. So it's just like everything that was going so well, just, just hit me. And I was depressed for a while. I was just like, I don't even want to live anymore. I can't control, like me and my girls fighting. We're supposed to have a baby we're excited about, then happen. And then football is taken away from me. So it's, what can I do now? And then I think even after, after the year, after I get done rehabbing, get a call from the Broncos and they're like, yeah, we're thinking about possibly bringing you back. But for now, we're there. We're going to just release you. So then it did. And at this point, I had a few teams reach out to me. So I got excited again. I was like, yes, yeah. so like it's not over. Like you can continue to do what you love. And then COVID happened. So <laughs> it was just like everything was against me. So I sat around for probably about like a year, play video games. Staying up until four or five o'clock in the morning, waking up at one o'clock. I was eat. I literally ate fast food every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Didn't care about life. I just didn't care. I was just like, who, who cares? I did what I needed to do. And then one day, it just I randomly just woke up and I was like, I can't live like this. I didn't make it this far to just to just give up. Now I didn't go to college and get a degree just to sit on my ass and just let life just take over. So it was hard. But then I woke up and like, I'm done playing video games. I'm gonna go get my real estate license. I'm gonna do things that help help me in my future and in my career. So then again, I get, uh, I get that mindset back, that mindset that I had when I was a kid. 
and things going well. And then I get a call randomly one day as I'm studying from real estate exams and it's the Cardinals calling me to see if I still wanted to play football. So then I'm like, everything's coming back. Everything's good. I found out my lady, we're having a, a baby boy. So I'm like, everything that I lost a year or two ago, it's all coming back. It's just slowly coming back to me. And then football didn't work out, but I got my real estate license. I have a, a great family. I love my family. I have a great son. He just turned one May 8th. So life came back around for me. And what I realized is people who are fighting the mental challenges and those injuries, you're only as strong as you are during the process and after the process. And what I mean by that is at that moment when you got your surgery and I got my surgery, it's, I can sit down here and just let life hit me in the face. Or I can get up and keep attacking each and every day at the best I can to get out of this feeling that I'm feeling. So for me, it was very challenging. And, and you guys should hear me talking now with mindset wise. It was a lot. But at the same time, it was like one of those things where you get used to being uncomfortable. So I was uncomfortable. But all the things I went through as a kid and through injuries and stuff, it was like, all right, this is just another day, DeMonte. It's just another day in the park. I'm ready to go. Let's see how long this one lasts. Let's try to attack this. And that's the mindset you got to have. And you got to have that each and every day, especially because as a man, we got to provide, we got to support. We got to be the one to bring in most of the money. We got to be the one to lead our family. We got to be the one to make sure things are going well. And it's a lot on us and men don't talk about it. You know, it's, it's everything's quiet. Oh yeah, I can do this. I can do that. But it's a lot. And if you don't talk to somebody about it, it, it builds up on you. And that's why a lot of men are, they just go through the motions. But it, I, it's for all the guys out there and even ladies, sometimes there's single moms out there to do things or even moms are the ones that provide it. It's, you have to look at it as, especially when you have kids, it's not about you anymore. It's about your kids. And when I was going through that mindset of being depressed and stuff and finally I had a kid, it was like, he didn't choose for me to be his father. I chose for him to be my son. I was the one who made the decision to have a kid, he didn't decide to be born. So it was like one of those things where I had to be there for my son. I had to do everything I could so that when my son has the same problems or go through the same situation I'm going through, I can say, son, I've been through that. I did this and this is how I got through it. But if I would have quit or if I would have gave up and then one day my son comes to me and looks me in the face and say, hey dad, I'm struggling in life. How can I get through it? And if I quit, how can I help him? That's what it was about, man. It's like I said, everything I do is it's always something deeper. So that's what helped me get through it. It was, it's not about you anymore, DeMonte. Who cares about your feelings? Who cares about what you got going on? It's about your son. It's about your family. It's about those things. And then when you start providing and doing those things, then I started working on myself mentally and stuff and I was able to get out of it. But what pushed me was my son mm -hmm. and my wife, my family. So that's how you get through those things is find out what's pushing you, what made you do the things that you're doing. And once you find out your why, your purpose of why you're doing something, never let go of it. And you go 110% for that reason. That's what I did. That's great perspective, DeMonte. Even though we just highlighted and you have this awareness, this mentality, it doesn't mean in life that we don't have serious waves crashing on us at certain times in our lives. And, exactly. and in those moments, you didn't have just one issue going on. You had multiple issues, as you mentioned, with your girl to being injured and not, and realizing, man, my dream of playing NFL football could be over yeah. to her father passing away. That is life. It's life yeah. that we all deal with, even when you're strong mentally and things like that. And I also want to highlight, it's the reason, everything that you said there, DeMonte, is the reason why we started this podcast, Life After Fame, because we wanted to know you guys on a human level. We wanted to know that, because people from the outside fans, they look in and they look at professional athletes. Oh, they've got it made. No problem. <laughs> That's really what they think. I think yeah. at times, and we wanted to highlight that. It's hey, like that. <laughs> it's not like that. You guys are human beings and you have yeah. issues. And how do you make this transition? And like you mentioned as well, for men, you're spot on. It's everything that we believe too. We're taught as young boys to cry. You don't yeah. show emotions. Yeah. It's certainly not those types of emotions that you're depressed or 
you're struggling. And yeah. so I think that you highlighting that, it really shows our audience that you guys are human and it's okay to have those human things and that you can rise above it. And so with that transition, you had mentioned that you started in real estate. And then I know that you also had another transition or a dual transition where you're yeah. also doing a sports academy where you train young athletes here in, in the Colorado area. Can you talk to us about that and what that transition was like as well? Yeah, I love real estate. I love meeting people, help with clients, but to make it as far as I did in sports, and knowing that kids probably went to a similar situation like myself, I wanted to help kids, one who's going through some problems I went through, but also help kids reach their dreams and their goals, whether the case may be, whether it's sports or school or life, where the case may be. And I've been through it. So I wanted to share my experience with these youth kids to show them, you know, the things you can do to make it and help them develop a young mindset that I have as far as in it would be uncomfortable, different things like that. And most importantly, I just love kids. I love hanging out with kids. I love helping kids. They got the best personalities and they're funny. But my ultimate goal for that is one day that the kids would be on a podcast like this and they will say, I had a mentor, a coach named Demonte that really helped me get through my life or helped me become successful in sports or help me become successful being the best dad I can be just by the little things that he did to teach me. And like I had with my dad and a few of my coaches. So that was the purpose of that. I really want to help these kids reach their dreams and reach their goals and just have these kids not be on the street and have them not being lazy and just sitting on video games and watching TV, but doing something active, doing something that can help you become successful because where I come from, a lot of my friends didn't make it out, whether they went to jail or they had babies at young ages and Unfortunately, we didn't have a role model that was helping like that. And when you make it as far as you do in life and even business, both of you guys, Joe, you looks like you guys are both doing fairly well and successful. At the end of the day, it's not about how successful you are, how rich you are, all the great things you got going on in your life. Life don't mean anything if you're only doing it for yourself. You should be trying to help others, reach out to others and help them get to your level. Because at the end of the day, and I ask you guys this question, what sounds better when you talk to your grandkids? Yeah, I was very successful, made a lot of money, and now I'm passing it down to you compared to me saying I was very successful. I trained 300, 400, 500, 600, however many athletes I touched souls on before I retired and say, and out of all those athletes, 200 of them became successful. Look at this one's a doctor, this one's a lawyer, and this one is a nurse. This one made it to the NFL. This one made it for the MLB. And it's, I touched so many souls to help them become successful. And now it's like contagious. So now those souls are spreading on to other people. So now it's just sharing love. And I think it's more impactful to help people get to your level. And that's what I find the joy in. It's easy for you to do it, but try to help somebody else get to your level. If someone else wanted to start a podcast, help them reach out, do things like that. Maybe have a, a young podcast for kids to learn how to do it. Because I'm pretty sure a lot of kids don't want to play sports, but they like talking about sports. They want to do podcasts. Teach them what you learn, show them what you learn and, and just reach out. Cause then when you talk to your grandkids, it's yeah, guys like, Hey, I've had a successful podcast, but I had 30 other people that I, that had their successful podcast and I helped them and I mentored them. And it's just, that's more heartwarming than saying, yeah, I was rich and I did all this in the world and I did it by myself. And so that's the way I look at things is whenever you get an opportunity to give back, you have to give back. And I think that's why the world, is, the way it is now is everyone's selfish. Everybody wants to be, oh, this is mine. This is me. I did this. I did that. It's cool to have those individual success that you can be proud of, but now help somebody else get there. So the so. website is dtsportsacademy.com. Any of our listeners can go and look through the, the site there. Can you give them an idea about what to expect if they register, if they contact you? Because it you know what's interesting here, DeMonte, is I think you fully recognize to be a successful in this life, you have to have God-given talent, but that's not enough. And you had a lot of great nurturing not and enough. mentorship that you have attributed your success to. And it sounds like that's a part of your academy. Can you talk about the type of person that, that should look into this and what can they expect once they sign in and sign up? Yeah, I always tell parents, one, well, you can sign up for a free section online. And that, that allows the kid to come in, allows me to meet the parents and the kid and see if they're a right fit for the gym and see if our gym's a right fit for them. But I always tell parents, like, if you're one of those people who are struggling with providing your kids with discipline, if you're struggling trying to teach your kids how to compete, or I have one kid in there that 
we're trying to teach them it's okay to lose, teach them the mindset of how to bounce back and even become, then we're the right gym for you. If you're someone also looking to help your kids get to the next level for whether it's high school or college, we're the right gym for you as well, because we, we touch base on all those things. We start with a fundamental age group and that's our six to 10 year olds. And we don't go too in details with the mechanics because they're still young. They're still developing. They're still growing. And ultimately, I don't want to wear those athletes out. So we'll come in, we'll do a nice warm up, and then we'll do, we'll have a speed day, a change of direction day, a quick feet day, different things like that. They will go through that. And then I'll put it together, have one big drill that they will do that kind of ties in the training that we did for that day. And then they'll do body weight workouts. And then at the end for 15, 20 minutes, we'll play a game. And I let the kids play the I let the kids pick a game in. They love dodgeball right now and they love football. Of course they love football. And I always say I'm Patrick Mahomes in there because I go against my other strength and conditioning coach, Brandon, and I call him Tim Couch because he's bald and with a beard, but he can't throw like me. So the kids <laughs> love, and we do like a draft. Like it's, and with the first pick, Demonte's going to select. And I say a kid's at name and they get so pumped and so excited and try to give them like what it would feel like. So they'd be like, you know what? Like one day I really want this to come true. So try to get that to them. But then we got middle school kids and theirs is more geared in and more focused and dialed in to prepare them for high school and competition sports. And then we have our high schoolers that, hey, we're trying to get you ready for college. So, and we do tests and we test all of our athletes for five, 10, fives, L drills, 20 yard dash, because we're not big enough for 40 yard dash, but 20 yard dash, for, so acceleration phase and three rep max for bench and squats. And it's cool because the kids come in and they see that every day the kids check the leaderboard. Did anyone beat me? Did anyone beat me? And that creates that natural competition. And so it's, it's great training for anybody that's looking for that. But ultimately, the whole purpose of all this is because I want to create this competition environment. So if sports don't work out and you go into a real job and it's, oh, this person's better than me, I want you to go back to the DTS days and be like, I remember that kid was faster than me and I busted my butt and then I became faster than him. Or I remember this kid was more athletic than me, but I busted my butt for all those years and then I became more athletic than him. I want them to have tap into that mindset of, yeah, you know what? Yeah, so what? He's more successful than me. So what? He's smarter than me. So what? He's doing this. But you know what? I'm going to compete with him and I'm going to learn everything from him. So that's my ultimate goal is trying to teach them that without them having to install in their brain. You just create an environment where kids can have fun, enjoy it, and teach them life lessons without them actually thinking too deep about it. So it's again, it's DT sportsacademy.com. You guys should go check it out. DeMonte is amazing with kids. I've actually seen him in action. And yeah, just hearing everything. What I hear in that, DeMonte, is that you're not just teaching them to be athletes. You're teaching them about life skills and you're having, and we've all played sports here and we've all played on certain teams where it wasn't fun. Uh, and what's the purpose? And so yeah. I love that that's your attitude and the way you go about things is that you make it fun for those yeah. kids and that's why they love it. And so, yeah, I really appreciate that. Again, it's dtsportsacademy.com. Definitely go check out DeMonte. Joe, yeah, do you have well, more one, questions one, for Mr. DeMonte? Yeah, because I have <clears throat> 52 DeMonte. And when you go, you're a little ways away, but <laughs> when you hit 50, it gets the middle aged guy because your <laughs> body and mind aren't in sync. You may want to open up a session yeah. about handling guys like me because how do you feel like you can do it again? But just another market there yeah. for you. I'm definitely yeah. going to sign up because 50 and yeah, over. There might be, yeah. have to be a little bit more over, psychology, yeah. but it might be an interesting type of thing. <laughs> I wanted to touch upon one thing that I think a lot of people are interested in. You went through an injury and it almost sounded like because of your situation, you didn't want to, you couldn't, you didn't feel like you could be honest and tell. Yeah. The one thing that is interesting for us fans is that when we hear our favorite player who's been cut or he's been traded, what you get is, and I totally respect it, is, hey, it's a business. To me, yeah. you guys are human beings. And I know you have to say that, but I almost feel like you, maybe deep down, you feel like a commodity. And that's a yeah. hard part to understand because in the professional world, if the normal person was treated the same way, oh, you're fired. Yeah. Man, yeah. it takes a big toll because this is what you've invested your life into. And then all of a sudden you're told, sorry. Yeah. How do you reconcile that? And how do you go through that? It's a business. I really hate it. I hate that statement, yeah. but I also understand yeah. it. Yeah, it's definitely a business. It's all about the number game. And even I had a great career for them, and I for sure thought that it was going to bring me back. And But injuries was the one thing that kept holding me down. But at the end of the day, it's 
you got to think about it in a work form. Say if you're somebody that was always calling off, right? Or if you're somebody that's always half-assing the job and you get fired, it's, yeah, I understand why I got fired. And just like in NFL, if you're always injured or you're always showing up late, different things like that, it's all you have to do. I do understand when I get cut. But people in the business world, I think about it like this. What if you're doing everything you can and your work ethic is one of the, the one of the ones that can't be matched, your energy, everything. And then one day you accidentally cut off one of your fingers at work and you can still do it. You can still do everything you can after you heal, but they're like, yeah, you know what? You're fired. That's what it's like. But on top of that, it's like, okay. That's the only income I had coming in. So then you got to find a whole new income. So for people who's going through that, it is just a business, but in the NFL, you can get cut for any reason. And a lot of it you can't control, but I always feel like in real life and the work, you can always control your situations at work. For the most part. Now there's sometimes where businesses just go downhill and things just don't work out that way. And you know, everyone gotta find a new job. My dad's done that multiple times working for steel mills his entire life. It's always it was always up and down. And all I can say through those situations is you always, no matter how successful you are, no matter what's going on in your life, either you gotta have multiple streams of income, is what I realized, so you can fall back on them, or you always have a backup. Something back up. So, and I knew if the NFL didn't want, it didn't work out. I wanted to do real estate, maybe become an investor or something like that. It just took me a while to get there because I didn't think I had to do it as soon as I did. I thought it was going to be, I thought I was going to get eight to 10 years out of NFL. I got three. So, you know, I had to come sooner. So always have a backup plan. I always tell people that you can't relax at work. And I don't know what you guys do for a living, but there's someone out there that's young like me and hungry for your spot to make the money that you're making, to be as successful as you. And a lot of times the people who get comfortable, those are the ones who get replaced. Mm. So you can't get comfortable because if there's another guy that comes in and producing just as great numbers as you and they're younger and I could pay them for a little cheaper, why not? So it's like one of those things where you got to... <laughs> You always got to give it your go. And sometimes even then, if you give it 110% and it just doesn't work your way, I always say that's just God. He wants, he got a different calling for you and you got to accept that. And it is what it is. So that's how I looked at it. And excellent advice today for not only our listeners, but for two older guys can learn. And that's what I've always prided myself with even my kids though, because that just because they're younger than me does not mean they don't have a ton of knowledge and things that I can learn from. And DeMonte, you have definitely given us yeah. tons of that today, where I've learned so much, not only about you, but mindset and those types of things. I just want to thank you so much for coming on to our show today and sharing your story and your life with us. And we're just extremely yeah, grateful Thanks, DeMonte. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. We want to thank former Michigan Wolverine and Denver Bronco DeMonte Thomas for joining Life After Fame. Check out DTSportsAcademy.com if you're looking for a premier sports performance training program built by athletes dedicated to helping the next generation of athletes perform at the highest level of sport. They are dedicated to making a difference in every athlete's life through athletic performance, training programs, to help them achieve their goals. That's dtsportsacademy.com. Thank you for listening. We appreciate you and your constant support. Life After Fame is not just a show about former athletes and celebrity. It's a show about life. Ordinary people like you and me who've achieved the extraordinary and how they transition out of the spotlight. We hope you enjoyed today's interview. If you haven't done so already, make sure you hit the subscribe button below to our podcast to find out all about the episodes that we've put out there and brand new interviews just being dropped. Please visit us at lifeafterfamenow.com and subscribe anywhere podcasts are found. Join us next week as we're going to have yet another insightful guest to tell their story on how they made the transition from the spotlight to their life after fame. On behalf of this episode's guest, former NFL pro DeMonte Thomas, I'm Joe B. With my co-host, Joe M. Embrace the transition in your life, knowing you are not on an island anymore with life after fame. See you next week.